Welcome everyone, good to see you this morning. I know there's still some coming in, beautiful day outside. Welcome to those who are joining us on Truth FM. Welcome to uh, the Kirkcaldy congregation also. The Kirkcaldy, some of the brethren in Kirkcaldy have had a, a wee outbreak of COVID, so they've shut the doors uh, of the building this morning and they're all back on Zoom just for this morning, hopefully. Uh, just for this morning anyway, I hope you're all doing well, but glad that we've still got this going so that you can be with us this morning. Good to be together uh, to worship again this morning and I'm Nicole and Sydney to open us in a word of prayer. Good morning, church. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this day, for us to meet together and to worship you. Father, we pray that as we've come together to um, worship you, Father, pray that our worship will be in spirit and in truth. Pray for those who weren't able to make it at this time, Father, due to um, illness, Father, or other problems. Pray that whatever's, whatever the problem may be, pray that I can heal them. We also pray, Father, thank you to help us to grow spiritually and numerically, Father, and help us so that we'll be able to, um, to glorify you. Father, we ask that you continue to be with each and every one of us with whatever problems that we go through, Father, and pray that our faith will increase no matter what we go through. Thank you for all your blessings, Father, and the love that you show to all of us. This word for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, what a lovely day. Thank God that uh, you managed to be here. <laughs> I was in the uh, traffic in Glasgow, but we are here. So, hallelujah, praise Jehovah. It's going to be our starting hymn. If you are able, please be on your feet. So that together we praise Almighty God. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, all the heavens praise His name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise proclaim, all His hosts together. Praising, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, God, ye high heavens and his blood down from the sky. Let, let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise, give, give Jehovah, they were made of his command. Then forever he established his creation ever stand from the earth of praise Jehovah, sun and moon, dragons of fire and hell and storm and flame for Of the 
Jesus Christ and judges all. And his great and great name, then say your name as young and small. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is a song. The Old Testament reading. Morning, church. The Old Testament reading is from Second Kings, chapter twenty-two, verse fourteen to the end of chapter twenty. That's Second Kings, chapter twenty-two. <laughs> Verse 14 to 20. So, Ikiah the priest, Aikam, Akwa, Shaham, and Isaiah went to Alda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Hahas, keeper of the wardrobe. He dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And he spoke with her. Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king, because they are forsaken me, and burnt incense to the other cult gods that they might pro provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation, a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord, Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. Amen. Good morning. The book of uh, New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Revelation, chapter 7. I'll be reading from verses 1 through 8. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 7, and I'll be reading from verses 1 through 8. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth, or sea, or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed all the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 
12,000 from the tribe of Isachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Hymn number 792. My eyes are dry. So we're going to sing this twice because it's just one stanza. Uh, eyes are dry. My faith is all. My heart is my friend, I call and I know my heart to be and life to and to be. Let's pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are able to come here in peace this morning. We're thankful for everything that we have, for our clothes, for our food, for the roofs above our head. We are truly grateful for the faith that we hold fast to, and we pray that you'll continue to increase our faith and bless us. Bless us, Father, as individuals and as a congregation, and indeed your congregations throughout the world. Father, we bring before you this disaster that's unfolding in Ukraine at the moment, where innocent people are being slaughtered, faithful people, your people, many are there and having to leave their homes. Many have no homes to return to. 
this disaster will affect each and every one of us, Father. And we will pray, we pray that we don't lose our faith, but you still continue to encourage beauty that surrounds us by your hands. Help us to realize, Father, just how blessed we are and that we can turn to you in times of trouble and strife that faces us today. For those, Father, who have lost their lives, we say we're sorry. Sometimes words just don't do it, Father. You know what's unfolding at the moment. You know the consequences. You know the end result. Please be with us as we go through these trying times and help us to help others who need help the most. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Do this in remembrance of me. Why did our Savior come to earth?
Good morning. I want us this morning to take a four-part look at the Lord's Supper. And the first look is, we need to look back. We need to remember the Lord's death when we look back to the cross. Because when we do so, we're reminded of our Lord's sacrifice, how he gave himself unselfishly and completely for the atonement of our sins. And the marvelous thing about the sacrifice of Christ is that he done it while we were yet sinners. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, it's easy to love the lovable, but it's not so easy to love the unlovable. But our Lord did just that. What Christ did for us is without exception. He did it for us while we were unworthy sinners. We always need to keep that in mind. Continuing on in Romans chapter 5, at verse 7, it says, For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So why do we look back? We look back to remember. Remembrance is reason one. We partake of the table of God's Son. The supper of our Savior and Lord, an ordinance not to be ignored. Remembering his body broke for all to save man from Adam's fall. And his blood shed for all of us who in Christ would put their trust. When we look back, we're humbled because we remember where we were. We remember where we were headed and we remember how we were saved. To paraphrase a quote from a man named Sinclair, Sinclair Ferguson, he says, if we think that the path we were on was right and that we deserve heaven, that's a sure sign that we have no understanding of the gospel. In other words, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. The second look at this four-part look at the Lord's Supper is we need to look within. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to 29 says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. We're given a warning here. The Lord's Supper isn't just about remembering, remembering about the, the sacrifice of Christ. It is also about having a reflection on ourselves. You see, anyone can remember a person, but it takes one that is affected by that person to reflect on themselves. So the question is, has Christ impacted our lives? Has what he done humbled us? Has his sacrifice changed us? Has he changed our thoughts? Has it changed our lives? We need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what are we doing with our lives? How are we living? Are we striving for holiness? I know that none of us are perfect or ever will be on this side of heaven, but are, are we trying to be? Or are we using grace as a crutch to just mess up 
Are we putting of Jesus first in our lives? Are we totally committed to him? Let us truly examine ourselves. Look deep into our hearts and reflect and repent. Reflection then is the thing to do for all he's done for me and you. Not only becoming our sacrifice, but also granting to men new life. Reflecting on our need to grow in accordance to the truth we know as we consider all that we can be in Christ as we labor for eternity. Repentance then must have a part as we truthfully survey our heart. When we identify a wrong within, to make the effort to turn from sin and turn from those deceitful ways which creep in from older days, to live a life which is crucified in Christ who for all of us had died. The third look at the four part look at the Lord's Supper is we need to look around. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting from verse 16, it says, The cup of blessing that we bless is not a sharing in the blood of Christ. The bread we break is not a sharing in the body of Christ, because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, since all of us share the Lord, share since all of us share the one bread. As we partake of the communion, let us give thanks to our God for, for our Christian family. No man. You remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians about what he received from the Lord and is passing it on? What night was it? The night he was betrayed. And what was Jesus doing? What was he saying? Who was he spending time with? It was the twelve. Jesus, the last thing he done partaking of the Lord's Supper. What does this say for us when we partake of the Lord's Supper? It's about the bond we share and the remembrance and the reflection and the repentance. Look around. How do we feel about taking the Lord's Supper with these people here? Are we glad? Do we rejoice that we have all our brothers and sisters around us? Are we supportive? Are we encouraging? Are we encouraged? In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, it says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist them. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. With Jesus spending time, it shows us that we need each other and we need to be there for one another. And the last part, well, this four-part look at Lord's Supper is we need to look ahead. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Are we looking forward to the time that Jesus will come again? Are we looking forward to when we will have communion with him and his kingdom? We should be. We should get excited that one of these days all our troubles will be no more. Because Jesus will return and take us to be with him in heaven forever. Are we looking forward to this day with joy or with fear? Someone was once asked, if you knew the Lord would return tonight, how would you spend the rest of your day? And that person replied without hesitation, I wouldn't do anything different than I do every day. Brethren, can we say that? Are we proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes? Are we committed to that? <coughs> Recommitment is then a final goal. As we seek to be spiritual whole, to live our lives above old ways, 
living each day to lift Christ's praise, recommitted to the Savior above, constrained to serve by his love, living life to the fullest for him, Christ who died to free us from sin. He could come today, maybe tomorrow, but for those of us who are redeemed, it makes no difference because we are ready. What is the question of be, are we ready? Now is the opportunity to know. I invite us all to examine ourselves as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as your children to just take a moment, Father, to think. Take a moment to remember. Take a moment to reflect. Take a moment to repent. Take a moment to look around. Take a moment to look ahead. Father, sometimes we, we take these things for granted. Sometimes the, the few minutes we have to partake of Lord's Supper is all that we use to remember you. Is all we use to, to gather our thoughts to focus on you. Is all we use to put you first. Father, forgive us for this. And help us understand the love that you have for us. The grace that you continue to show us. The mercy you continue to show us. The blessings you continue to pour, pour on our lives. Father, sometimes we can become so, so weak. That we rejoice when we're together. But as soon as we leave these doors, Father, we forget. Forgive us for this. Forgive us to, forgive us when we forget, for, when we forget to commit to each other. It's so easy to get on with everyone, Father, when, when we're liked, when we're in agreement. But sometimes little things get in the way and hate builds up, anger builds up, resentment builds up in your body that's supposed to be united. Father, forgive us for this. Because when we forget all these things, we put, we put ourselves above you. We put ourselves above the sacrifice that was made for us because we think we're better. Because we think that we're better than to forgive those that are part of us. We're better than to, to teach those that make fun of you or make fun of us. We're better to ask for forgiveness when we fall. Father, humble our spirits, humble our hearts, humble our minds. Reflect in our lives every single day. To carry our cross every single day and follow you. For that's the commitment, Father. Help us to strive to live like this every single day. And Father, for that sacrifice that was made, help us never, ever to take it for granted. Help us never, ever to be ashamed of it. To fear about telling others about it. But it's the only way that they can be saved. Yet we fear sometimes to tell others. We're embarrassed. We're ashamed. But all we're doing is leading them further and further astray when we do this. Give us the boldness. Give us the confidence, Father, to be soldiers of you. Forgive us our sins. Our sins that 
needed Jesus to go on the cross for us. For Father, he was blameless. He was without sin. It was because of me. It's because of everyone in this room, because of everyone in this world that he had to come down and die. Father, forgive us. Father, give us the heart that is eager to look forward to your coming. <clears throat> For we know that sometimes when, when, we, when we wait, we sort of lose hope. Help us never to lose that hope, Father. Always, always seeking your coming and living our lives accordingly. We pray for the bread as a symbol of his body that was broken for us, Father. And we pray that you bless every head that's bowed. For your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's pray again. Father, we come before you once again to pray for the fruit of the vine. The fruit of the vine that represents the blood. Father, we as humans, we need blood to survive. We have blood running through our veins blood that pumps from our heart, Father, all around our body so that we can live. Father, your son shed his blood so that we can live forever. So that we have that opportunity to be called your children. He shed it freely for us. Help us never to forget that sacrifice. For without the shedding of his blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. Father, we thank you. And it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All in remembrance of God's Son, who came and died for everyone. When we reflect on needed change and not wanting to remain the same, then with a really repentant heart, a course for change, we can chart. Ending with true, recommitted lives to honour and serve Jesus Christ. God bless. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Edwin, for that great thought. Indeed, we need not to forget what the Lord has done for us. God is going to speak to us, and we have to also remember what His Son has done for us, giving us this opportunity to come together as a family to worship Him. Let us be our son and those who are able and sing this together to recognize the sacrifice that God made through his son.
Good morning. Adam has asked me to read the book of Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. This will be a long lesson, so I hope you all brought a snack to enjoy a bit later on. I'm just kidding. Good morning. What a beautiful start to the day. I heard that. Paul's away. <laughs> I'm out. He's away. He's down to Iceland to get everybody a piece of fruit. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. Grateful to have the Kirkcaldy Bread and Rock Townie. We've got uh, all those folk there with us. I'm uh, sorry to hear that there's been a wee outbreak of COVID. I know what that's like, because we've had it here uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, but grateful you can join us, and hopefully we have a good fellowship and enjoy that presence of each other as we worship and have worshipped God and remembered his son, Jesus. We go through my life in him, and we consider today the passage that Johnson read for us, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, in a little while, we're going to build just a little bit of background to what Paul is discussing there. And we begin with the question of promises, prayers, and presence. When you go back to Genesis, it starts with God. And it makes sense that if it starts with God, it ends with God. The Garden of Eden is what we can call temple. The idea of temple is a place where God is. And it's remarkable when you go through the first chapter of Genesis that you see this expression that's being made of, it is very good. He creates humanity, he creates Adam on the sixth day, and he says, it is very good. And the earth was just, it must have been amazing. I can only imagine. I can only imagine how amazing the earth must have been back then, that God created it brand new with everything that it was. Certainly, what it must have been like before Genesis 3 when he had to curse the land. In the midst of all that was very good, God plants a garden. And in that garden, he places humanity in the form of Adam and Eve. There was communion. There was learning. There was commitment. There was love. There was unity. There was no sin, no shame, no problems. And sadly, humanity wouldn't allow that to stay the same. Sin destroyed the perfection of God's relationship with us. All our own doing, all our own, all our own blame, and no one, all our own fault rather, and no one to blame but ourselves. So God made a promise. He curses the serpent, he curses the woman, he curses man, he drives humanity out of the garden, he prevents us from ever accessing the tree of life, but he also places within that in verse 15 what some consider to be a promise. Promise that we begin to see unfolding in, uh, almost immediately, but we see it coming to fruition in the arrival of Christ, as Paul would identify in Galatians 4. At the appropriate time, at the due season, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin. He gave us a shot in those early days at the whole DIY thing. Let's try this without God and see what happens. But we just made everything worse. Thankfully, God wasn't intending to just let us go. Yes, he gave us the freedom. Yes, we ended up murdering each other and constant evil thoughts within our minds till eventually Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, was chosen to rescue humanity and only eight souls got on that ark all those thousands of years ago. People prayed and sought the Lord. The descendants of Seth started seeking him out. Others built for themselves towers and cities and sought to make a name for themselves. And how prototypical it is of humanity in those days that we still think that we can manage without God, that we know We still build towers. 
We still build cities. We still think we can manage without God, just like Babel. And just like Babel, we remain confused and unintelligible to ourselves as we grasp in the darkness. We build communities, but the wrong kind of communities. We learn, but we learn the wrong things. We commit to everything but God. Just go into your phone and have a look at your subscriptions and see the commitments you have made. We do that. Our gym memberships. Our Reader's Digest. Does anyone still get those? You know, we make commitments, but we commit. We love, but we find it in all the wrong places. We claim unity, but only if it advances our needs. We are bewitched by the collective culture and ignorant of the presence of God. And it's all because of our stinking thinking. Richard Rohr wrote just a couple of months ago on a blog, we are all dedicated to our own habitual way of doing anything, our own defenses, and most especially our patterned way of thinking or how we process reality. To put it another way, we are addicted to our own way of thinking. Rohr writes about addiction, and we are addicted. We're addicted to sin. It might not be drugs, it might not be alcohol, it might not be tobacco, but we have that word sin, and we might even pontificate against it. But it is still in our lives. And so we need to remember, as John Levinson wrote, that what caused man's banishment from the garden was his unwillingness to accept a status inferior to that of God. Can any of us accept a status inferior to God? Do we honestly believe that we could actually be better than God? I know we've made some jokes about it or made some comments about it in previous lessons where we might say that grace seems like a bad idea. But the thing is with grace is the idea it's because it's all God's idea. And we don't like the idea of God knowing what's best for us if we as humans think we have a better way of doing it. God doesn't have bad ideas. We are made to be his image bearers. We are thinking creatures. Word that you might hear is sentient. It's more than just being aware of our own existence, though we have the ability to actually make choices. And not only that, but to carry out those choices. We are unique amongst all the created uh, animals that exist within our planet because not only can we think beyond what they can we actually record our thinking and pass it on in writing and in media of various sorts to the next generation so that they can learn and understand and and take that further forward as they go on and we can only do this because we have minds and we only have minds to think with and ponder with and consider with and contemplate with and choose with because God has given us a mind. And as image bearers of God, it is our responsibility to reveal the mind of God to the world around us. God can think because we can think and he made us like him. But we have become addicted to our own way of thinking. And so we need to be healed by his way of thinking. That involves praying purposefully. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is that of Enoch. I dwell on it a lot. I've probably mentioned it enough that you know where I'm going to go with it. But can you imagine having a relationship with God? Enoch lived to be 365. Can you imagine having a relationship with God that every moment of your waking life is spent with God? Where you're walking with God, where you're talking with God, where you're listening to God. From the moment you wake up to the moment you go back to bed. That's how I imagine Enoch's relationship with God. But then Enoch would get tired and he would lie down and he would need to sleep and he would let his mind do what the mind does when we go to sleep. And then he'd wake up again. And eventually God must have thought, I miss those eight or so hours that he has to sleep. And on one of those days when they walked, perhaps he said to him, as Matthew Henry once wrote, 
We're closer to my house than we are to yours now, Enoch. Why don't you just come to my home? And he was no more, for God translated him. Jesus prayed a lot. He prayed in the mountain. He prayed in an upper room. He prayed in the garden. He prayed. He prayed for Peter that he not be sifted like wheat. So many prayers. One stands out for me in Mark, uh, sorry, John chapter 11, verse 41. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. God listened to Jesus. Jesus prayed. God listened. Have you ever thanked God that he heard your prayers? We thank him for our food. We thank him for forgiveness of sins. We thank him for the nice things he has granted to us. Have you ever thanked him for having heard your prayers? Father, I thank you that you have heard me. The longest recorded prayer that Jesus said is, is found in John 17. And if you don't know it, you need to know it. You need to go and look at it. In fact, it's one of those chapters that I would say you need to read often. Put it on your reading list. Read it once a month, maybe more often if you can, at least once a year. But even then, I would still do it. Maybe start off with the year by reminding yourself what Jesus was praying for. Because he mentions us in this prayer. Not specifically by name. But he does mention us. Because it's you and I he is praying for. In verses 20 and 21, I do not pray for these alone. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for unity. And he is basing that unity on who God is. That they may be one just as we are one, he says in verse 22. If you want to know how that unity works, read the Gospel of John. The whole book's talking about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. The unity of God. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says, Therefore I have not spoken in my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say, what I should speak. When he is preparing to leave, he says to his disciples, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. But we are all addicted to our own way of thinking. How human is that, that we are addicted to our own way of thinking? Jesus is utterly restrained to speak only what the Father says can be spoken. When the disciples asked, when are you coming back? He said, nobody knows, not even the angels of heaven, but only my Father. The Holy Spirit is utterly restrained to speak only what is said from the throne of God. But us, well, we can only know unity if we abandon stinking thinking and wholly submit to God's way. Problem, though, is Christians can be carnal. Adam's been talking about this in the Corinthians class on Thursday nights. I'm enjoying that class. I'm enjoying getting into the Word. I'm enjoying just being with others. And it'll be good to be back in the building, to be physically present, as well as on Zoom or uh, having been on Zoom for so long. It'll be nice to do that again. But being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins means receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how Peter put it in Acts 2.38. The Holy Spirit is given to the Christian as a guarantee of our new relationship with God that is found in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22. However, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian does not make us spiritual. Don't believe me? Read 1 Corinthians. Show up for Adam's class on Thursday night, and you'll get the idea that these are people who are our brethren, who lived 2,000 years ago, who were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
And Paul says they were carnal. Because, well, that's actually the wrong one. We'll come back to that. Missed a bit there. But we are all addicted to our own way of thinking. You see, the carnal mind is equivalent to division. And that's what we see. The carnality of our Corinthian brethren is written because of division. And in contrast, as Neil Scobie said to me just the other day, unity is the hallmark of spirituality. In fact, I needed to go on because I missed that one out. There we go. Do you see the difference? Take off a wedding ring. You got a gold wedding ring. Mine doesn't fit anymore. Need to get it fixed. Take the wedding ring off. You have a look at it. On the inside, there's a little stamp. Call that the hallmark. The hallmark on it has some information. that You can barely read it in most rings. But on it's got a little bit of information that tells you how much gold is in the ring, if it's a gold ring. And it's an authentic depiction on that to say this has got real gold in it. Might be nine carats, might be 14 carats, might be 18 carats. We're going to find out in a minute from Finlay and Anna Rose, what mum and gran have got in there. You know, we'll just find out who got the better ring there on that one. But you can look at that ring and you can see that hallmark. For us, the hallmark of our spirituality is unity. The spiritual Christian who has the presence of God restored by obedience to Christ Jesus and then surrendering to the, surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit is what makes us spiritual. Not just saying I'm a Christian. Not just being baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. But recognizing the need to obey and surrender to, look to Jesus. And so we have to become spiritually surrendered. If you haven't noticed the news in the last 10 days, where have you been? It's everywhere. There's a constant running update on the BBC web, uh, on the app as well, that gives you the latest that's happening in Mariupol and uh, Kharkiv and Kiev and various places throughout Ukraine as that war rages. And a defiance of a leader who says, we will not surrender. Glory to Ukraine and all that goes with it. And on the other side, an enemy that is invading their country, that isn't going to stop because they won't surrender either. But brethren, we need to learn how to surrender spiritually. Because that would then allow the Holy Spirit to lead. So how does the Holy Spirit lead? First of all, he leads with our consent. We give our consent to his leadership when we obey the gospel and we are saved. By invitation through obedience, he is given to us by God. And daily, we continue to give our consent with these words. Not my will, but yours be done. James would say about going to and fro and trading and trying to do yourself better. And John, uh, James 4. And he says, shouldn't it be better to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this about. In Luke twenty two forty two, Jesus' words were, not my will, but yours be done. Shouldn't those be our words? If that's the words that Jesus prayed, shouldn't we pray the same thing? Secondly, he leads us when we follow him with humility and surrender to God, just like Jesus and the Holy Spirit demonstrated to us in John 12, 49, and in John 16, 13, and in other passages throughout the Gospel of John and throughout the life of Christ, Philippians 2. To have the mind of Christ who surrendered himself to be a servant and to death upon a cross. If Jesus would not speak of his own authority and the Holy Spirit would not speak of his own authority, why would we think that we know better? Well, as Paul said to the Corinthians, are you not carnal? The Holy Spirit leads when we follow God's will. And when we lay down our will and submit to God's will, then the Holy Spirit produces fruit, his fruit. Galatians 5 and verse 22, 
But the fruit of the Spirit is, you can read the next two verses, that and the next verse. But did you catch how Paul begins this short two verses? But the fruit of the Spirit. Did you catch it? It's not my fruit. It's his. It's not my produce. It's his. It's not my strength. It's his. It's not my efforts. It's his. Not my fruit. It's his. Sadly, we prefer to say, not thy will, but mine be done. Perhaps we only like the first verse of the song, all of self and none of thee. Perhaps we want to take the credit of saying, my fruit, not the Holy Spirit's. We are all addicted to our own way of thinking. But of the Holy Spirit's fruit, Paul writes, against such, there is no law. The law was given that humanity would know what sin is. In Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. But I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Does God need the law to know what sin is? Does God need instruction on how to love or to express joy, to have peace or to demonstrate patience, to show kindness or goodness or faithfulness or gentleness and self-control? There is no law against such because the law does not argue against the divine nature. When God, through his Holy Spirit, is allowed by us to lead us, then fruit is produced. His fruit. I can't love better than God already does. I can't have more joy than God already has. I cannot have the peace that passes understanding unless it is God giving me that peace. I cannot show the patience that God has. 120 years, Adam, from the calling of Noah to the sailing of the ark. I cannot have the kindness that God has. I cannot... <clears throat> have as much goodness as God has. He cannot express the faithfulness that God has. Where Paul would say of Jesus, he cannot deny himself. I cannot show the gentleness that God has. I cannot demonstrate the self-control that God has. In various ways and in various times, any of these traits can be expressed in a person's life, even yours or mine. But it's cheap fruit. It's wonky fruit. You know, I was in Aldi's the other day, and there's a little part of the uh, fruit section. You know, you walk in, you get the grapes and the oranges and the apples. And if you know Aldi's, you kind of know where you're going. But if you go on the other side, you can find the wonky fruit. I couldn't find any wonky fruit. But remember, there was a time when bananas had to be a particular straightness. That's why, we're, that's why we had Brexit, because we were fed up with them telling us what about our bananas and how straight they were. And the thing is, is that I can produce fruit, not a banana, obviously, but, you know, the kind of fruit we're talking about in Galatians. But it's always going to be wonky fruit. And the thing about wonky fruit is it's kind of a one-in-a-lifetime thing for that tree. Fruit tends to come out looking pretty much the same way. Apples, oranges, bananas. And the thing about human fruit is, that is to say, the works that we produce is, would you, anyone like this? blackened the banana it goes off our fruit rots our fruit changes wonky fruit's an anomaly it tastes fine but it's not always repeatable and sometimes it's not always wanted i can love enough to lay down my life for another person but i can struggle to love others especially those who've wronged me i can have joy but i also know depression and joy is easily suppressed in such times. I can have peace, but I also have sleepless nights and anxieties. I can have patience, but I've also had it tested by teenagers and other road users. I can have kindness, but I have been cruel at times. 
I can have goodness, but I have hurt others. And sometimes I've done it deliberately. I can have faithfulness, but I still let people down. I can have gentleness, but I can be unfair. I can have self-control, but sometimes, oftentimes, temptation wins. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit cannot and will not have the alternate to these wonderful expressions of the presence of God. In Galatians 5 and verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, and he goes on and lists them. It is my works of the flesh contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit that Paul has in mind. Work, effort, that's what I do. Fruit is what he does. I can plant, I can cultivate, I can harvest, but I cannot will it to grow. Along for the sermon, Adam, when you get up here, tell us about a visit to a farm in Sparta, Tennessee, where he meets with a family that, well, that you've loved most of your life, much of your life. And you sit there and you remember fond times working on the farm as you're eating walnuts. You want to know what those walnuts taste like. Surely by now there has to have been a harvest. I seem to remember you saying one time it would be 13 years before they would ever produce a harvest. Well, it's about 30 years, isn't it? 35 years. Adam planted those walnut saplings in the heat of a summer. He probably watered some of those walnut plants in their earliest days, but I dare him to say that he made them grow, because he didn't. It's God who gives the increase. And so it is with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God has planted the Spirit within every Christian who has obeyed the gospel. God's word has been the bread and water of our growth as Christians. Jesus himself in John 7, 37 to 39, would describe how we have become fountains of living waters, the presence of the Spirit in our lives, and the increase, the crop, the produce is God's as well. So we need the fruitful relationship. My surrender to God is equivalent to his success. The word spirit is mentioned in Paul's writings in 128 verses. And of them, 87 are specifically about the Holy Spirit. It talks about being led by the Spirit, begun by the Spirit, the mind of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, living in the Spirit, the might of the Spirit, the unity of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, supplication in the Spirit, fellowship in the Spirit, love in the Spirit, joy of the Holy Spirit, sanctification by the Spirit, justified in the Spirit, kept by the Holy Spirit, regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. It's a fascinating little study. And he says all that because temple is now in us. We are God's temple individually and collectively. God has come to reinstate his presence by abiding with us who are his people. To our own way of thinking. So instead, I will stop being me and I will surrender to letting him be him in me. And that will be a fruitful relationship. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Graham, for that inspirational words. All about Jesus, 
more about Jesus, well, I know more of his better heart and soul, more of his heaven mercy, more of his love who died for me. To read a passage from Matthew chapter 6, starting from verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or weep, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, and not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, but tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day 
has an F toll of its own. How many of us meticulously plan ahead? Maybe we do a lot of it, maybe just a little. Maybe some of us plan just about everything and others just a few things. Maybe we've planned out how our work is going to be, the career we want, and how we're going to achieve it. Whether that means we need to go to college or to university or a workplace training scheme. Maybe we'll plan where we need to live, perhaps to do with our work, or perhaps how we want, where we want to be in our life, whether we want to rent or to buy, according to those circumstances. We look at our children and we want the best for them, so we try and put them in the right schools. Maybe even we do simple things like having an eating plan so our diet is right. Maybe sometimes we even look back and we see many deviations from our plan because it haven't quite worked out the way we've looked at it. I can certainly look back at mine and, and certain events, some beyond my control, have completely changed my plans, yet with some things I still manage to keep on track. But what if suddenly everything was turned upside down because a foreign force besieged your country and plunged it into turmoil? Yeah, we see how Russians have invaded Ukraine and the world has said, oh, we've got your back, but now you have houses destroyed, businesses lost. You're just simply looking for a safe place for you and your family to sleep, living perhaps from one meal to the next. All your belongings perhaps are in a rucksack. All you planned for and built is gone. There was a porter when talking, when reporting yesterday said, maybe even a religious question where God is now. Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, what you eat or wear. Well, maybe you never had and now they do because everything that was secure, everything that seemed to be good has changed. But he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. Um, that is where we come in. We are God's people and we have a responsibility to do all we can to give them hope and not despair and worry. You know, we saw that at least half a million people have fled to Poland. It wasn't that long ago in history, in fact, in the 80s, when Poland themselves had problems. In fact, my dad, I know my dad and my uncle and, and many others were involved in a convoy of lorries that took supplies to, to those people, often with challenges on the way that they had to try and get over as they went. There are many things that need our attention daily. And many of those within our own community. That is what this time is about. Let it not be said Christians 
didn't do enough. Instead, that we are light in this dark world. Sure, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us stability and so many blessings, so many things we take for granted, and yet we see others that are so much worse off than we are. Some that have been in our position, perhaps, and have lost everything. We ask that we always appreciate everything that we have and that we can remember to share everything that we possibly can to make other people's lives different, that others can see that we live up to being the people of God, being your children, by going beyond those means that sometimes we feel we're able to and being able to help many others. We thank you that you require us to think on these things and to challenge ourselves regularly with so many things to help and to better our lives by, by doing these things. We ask this in Jesus' name. This is our final hymn for our service uh, today. Uh, shall we be outstanding those who are able so that we sing this hymn? There is a Yeah. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time uh, of the week that we can come together away from the chaos of the world and remember uh, your son Jesus. We can sing your praises. Uh, we can hear from your word. Father, we pray that you'll help us to gain strength and encouragement from being here this morning. Father, we pray for those who have not been here that you'll be with them and uh, encourage them to return to us. Father, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, uh, the son which uh, showed us love by coming to this earth, knowing the sacrifice we had made and the hope that he gives us for eternity. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.